Well, I'm, this is the time I want to mention that I'm now going through transition, everybody. Here we go. That's my band. Do you, are you a musician? Um, no, but the, her husband is. So her husband did this music. I don't know about musicians. I love that I go, are you a musician? No, but her husband's a musician. Well, no, my, my son-in-law. Produces music. He well, produces music. Well, um, I wouldn't be surprised if you did music, though. If I did music? Yeah, well, you're talented. So, so, you. so, no, no, but listen, now this is, oh, hey, 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 now, now this is important. This is Before, important. Well, let me talk about yeah. it because some people to just listen and don't watch. Yeah, Brian, ahead. Brian Sorry. Callen is here. You know, this is Howie Mandel does stuff. I'm Howie Mandel. This is my lovely daughter. Jacqueline Schultz. Yes, Jacqueline Schultz. Jacqueline Schultz. Schultz. That's her name. Yeah. And, right. and you are Brian Callen. Yes, sir. Yes, and That's I'm a, I'm a big fan, and I and I'm a big fan of uh, your stand up comedy. I'm a big fan of the first time I, I was aware of you was probably Mad TV. Mm -hmm. I didn't know you, and then right. I saw you, and you were yeah. really funny on that show, and I became a fan. And then um, your stand up is really we got to work together. I don't know if you remember. Well, in, I, I do in Valencia, and I and I I can't believe you remember that because I remember I was you know when you when you're out in the uh, you when you're touring and you're doing stand up and you know you you you've had some success and you you know whatever you 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 feel like you're kind of in the trenches and you you're with all your boys who are kind of making noise and then Howie Mandel comes in and I I didn't know you I I figured you had been doing stand up way before so now and I remember I did pretty well in that room I remember I I did you kicked that yes but so I said like then and this is all in transparent I I, I remember thinking to myself Howie Mandel's got to follow that what a dick I am, because I didn't think you'd done, been doing stand-up. I thought, he's probably coming back to do some stand-up, and he's not going to, you know, it's, he's, he's more of an actor. He, maybe he did stand-up back then. And I thought to myself, I remember thinking to myself, because I liked you, but I thought to myself, that's going to be a tough follow. This <laughs> right. sounds really cocky, but it's just true. I've been... I had been, I was at the boiling point. I think I was about to shoot my special. So sometimes, you know, when you get, it's all the, all the edges are, are, um, smooth, smoothed out. And you're just, you're, it's a magic trick. You're hitting it. And I remember thinking to myself, well, good luck following that, which is an obnoxious thing, but that's what I thought, not in a mean way. And, <laughs> and then you get up and I, it was unbelievable. You crushed well, the room you. no no but that's a fact hold on this is important because you crushed with such good material and it was like you didn't miss a beat you were like oh that's great you were so happy you were like you were happy for me you were happy for the room no intimidation and you go in and just destroy harder than i had with unbelievable jokes and i remember going well that's why he's howie mendel that's why he's that's that's real talent well that's coming from you that means a lot but it's just it, true I've, I've told the story many times by the way this is not i, I can't I, i'm glad that i'm able to tell you the story because i've told the story to so many people about how talented you are and how longevity like yours is not a mistake but so. well, and i appreciate that but truth be told i did not know you i knew you did stand up and i knew you from mad tv and then when i saw you in that same room talk about crush you crushed and it was amazing and i learned more about you just watching that set because you talk i didn't know at even at that time this is years ago yeah. so i didn't know that you were into martial arts mm -hmm. and uh, everybody knows that now but i didn't know that you were and you're incredibly physical on stage you you deliver not only verbally and and mentally but even physically i mean you are it just uh, it's so if you have a chance if you haven't seen him you know check into his specials or go see him live I, I man imagine tears man tears russell peter's gave me the the uh the title of my last special i dropped on youtube called man tears which uh <laughs> he's so great but yeah i mean uh it's it's going well i guess but you know then you shoot a special and then you drop it and then you have to start from scratch and i just got out of my writer's block just now so here. you're in writer's block you said you just got just now just like this moment like sitting here this weekend at the <laughs> oh. improv in florida like i just i kind of just sat still yeah long enough till something hit and i got i got to what i was really talking about i kind of like you know you know i don't know if you suffer from this but sometimes when you're you know this will be my fifth special i'm working on and you don't want to repeat yourself but sometimes as a human being you can get hung up on the same questions the same problems right so i've always been obsessed with the notion of how you define masculinity or how you define courage and 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 the difference between a uh, a hero and a coward those are always, you know, I think men, <clears throat> our biggest fear is that we're cowards. Our biggest aspiration is to be a hero. 
But it may very well be, but there's no difference. Do you think that comes out of insecurity, though? Uh, you want to be a hero, but we're yes, really not that heroic. At all. In fact, I would say that we're always afraid, but it's the, the coward who can assume the position trembling in their boots that, that we look up to, right? So I, I think... Um, but that becomes an obsession, an obsession, a question you're constantly trying to ask. And if you look at most authors, most filmmakers, they tend to deal with the same questions, the same genre. But I think in today's marketplace, you know, you've got to surprise yourself and then you'll surprise the audience. And sometimes you've got to shake up your paradigm. You've got to shake up sort of the mental scaffolding that you've been walking around with. And as you get older, you've got to kind of key into the things you're insecure about, the things you're afraid of, the, the, the person you're pretending to be versus the person you want to be, all those things. So, so that's anyway. the theme of your comedy. I think, I think so. I think the idea was I always knew that this exercise in masculinity, provider, protector, all these things, um, was a costume. It, you know, we're, we're, we are, whether you know it or not, if you, if you ever talk to like um, high level MMA fighters or, or tip of the spear, uh, you know, operators in the military, like Delta guys or SEAL Team 6 guys, they're never really macho around you, ever. They, they, they don't even tell you what they do and they're, they're the least, they're the last person to be as impressed with themselves as you are with them. And I think some of it comes from the fact that they know how easy it is to kill a human being, no matter how much training what kind of muscles they have, how tough they, they are in the cold or how, how well they do with sleep deprivation. I can, they, they know that if you, like, so my, I knew a guy who's an operator who said, if you get stabbed, if I just do this with a small knife, if I stab you in the torso, if you don't get help right away, you're going to die because you're going to lose pressure. There's an equilibrium in your body that your body has to have, blah, blah, blah. And I think that when you get closer to, mortality as we are you and i are both getting to an age where you know it's i have felt kids. this close from the time i was seven but that's well, that's probably neurosis. part of where your comedy comes from and part Absolutely. of where your talent comes from but i think that um the challenge as you get older is to continue to ask questions that and and to continue to explore themes that um you may not have been as interested in, or you may have answered the question. You may answer the question, you know, that you were working on. Now, now what? Now, what are you going to do? How do you stay relevant? You know. So that being the question, when you show up and they go see you now at a club, mm -hmm. and you're, first of all, the audience. Do, do you find that the audience wants to see what they already saw? They they're there because they love you. Yeah. They're there because they heard something. It's kind of, this is the dichotomy between being a, com a comedian and a rock star. Yes. You know, when you're a rock star, they want to hear the hit. Yep. When you're there, when you're a comedian, if you did your hit, they go, we heard that. Right. You know, which that's is the thing about us. We have to keep coming up with new songs. So knowing that you're showing up at a club with what you were uh, framing as your writer's block, even though you're coming out of it, what, what do you do? What are you doing? I am always tapping into these larger questions. You know, I love the contradiction. I love how uh, human beings are so contradictory. I, I, I've always said that human beings are bipolar apes. That that actually comes from a book called The Bipolar Ape. But 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 we are bipolar apes. We're sinners, saints, and everything in between. You know, we we are capable of terrible destruction and cruelty, but also unimaginable beauty and creativity. And I think we have both in us. That's that Jungian notion that you, you know, for your, for your branches, for your head, the branches to touch heaven, your roots have to touch hell. You've got to get in touch with the side of yourself that is so horrific and monstrous. And not only do you have to get in touch with that side, but you have to conceive of the notion that you could actually enjoy being that. You could be a Nazi prison guard and enjoy it. If you can come to that conclusion, if you can accept that, then you can end that and you can become, um, uh, you can become uh, the best person you can be. So the angels of your lesser nature should always take a backseat to the angels of your best nature. And Why would you want to get in touch with the worst? That that's that's a Jungian notion. So he said if it was called ending the civil war. So if you are a, a, a therapist, right, um, you will. But I'm, gonna, I'm I'll give you another reason why it's important. Um, if you're a therapist, you are somebody who is going to hear horrific things, and it'll be impossible for you to be objective. You will have a judgment on your patient unless you can see and conceive of yourself being exactly like that person. 
somewhere in the recesses of your mind, you have the imagination to touch that monstrous side of you. And Jung said that we have all of those in us. And he, one of the things that he thought was fascinating was if you look at psychosis, if you look at psychotic breakdowns right. um, across cultures that have nothing to do with each other, they all deal with the same, they all have similar um, uh, uh, psychic structures. Like the psychic structures that, that are manifested when somebody has a psychotic break um, or hallucinogen or, or a nervous breakdown, whatever it might be, are all very similar. Whether you're a shaman in the Inuit tribe of, you know, the Antarctic or wherever, or you're in Brazil in the Yanomamo tribe or whatever, or you're a Western Swedish, you know, doctor, there seem to have been these through lines with these psychic structures. So it kind of led him to believe that all of us have these, um, these, this connective tissue. But, but here's, a better, here's a better and more important reason why you want to get in touch with your darker side. You know, they've had a lot of um, success. I'm quoting Jordan Peterson now, but they've had a lot of success with um, dealing with PTSD with soldiers. Right. Because what happens is, so, so a soldier comes back and he can't live down what happened and, you know, God forbid, puts a gun in his mouth, but suicide's a real problem, right? Or destroys himself with drugs and alcohol. Can't live down certain things that he saw and did. But it might be deeper than that. It, sometimes you're a kid from Iowa or wherever you're from. You grew up in a Christian household. You went to church on Sunday. Your parents paid taxes. You learned to follow the rules and you had a contract with life, which is I'm going to do it. I'm going to be a good person. And he is a good person. He raised, you know, a dog and he, he's good to his sister and, and, and his community. And he goes to the mil gets into the military. And he gets in the military because he wants to fight for his country and he believes in good guys and bad guys and he believes in all the, the, the good and evil kind of motifs that, that were raised with that Judeo-Christian ethic and all that stuff. And um, he's fighting on the side of good. And then what happens is war makes a mockery of that. It takes that whole contract and rips it up. And, and you end up doing things that, first of all, you may see things and you end up doing things. And in order to cope, in order to not lose your mind when you're doing it, you may end up doing things that are pretty horrific because because that because war and here's the problem you may have enjoyed it you may get addicted to it and that's what nobody tells you now when you come back into society how are you supposed to live that down how are you supposed to without context think of yourself as a good person if you did all that stuff over there and one of the things that really helps ptsd with certain soldiers is the idea when it's presented to them that, hey, 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 brother, listen, we all, we all have that in us. And if you look at the people that have really studied the human psyche, like Carl Jung, et cetera, um, your roots can touch hell. And the good news is your roots touched hell and now your branches can touch heaven. You got both in you. And that's, that was the exercise there. And that's what your, that's, that's your privilege now. And that really helps. That can really help a young person get out of the hell that they're in. Are you in therapy? I'm not in therapy, but I'm, I'm, I should be. Really? <laughs> yeah. I'm fascinated with the idea. Is um, that, is that a uh, lesson help you with your comedy? Is it does. Yeah. It does because I ask myself, I ask myself those deeper questions. I, like, especially now I kind of say, well, you know, uh, how do I want to die? How do I not want to die? What do I want to say before I die? What do I want to bring with me on my deathbed? What am I going to regret? You know, um, are you afraid of dying? I don't think so. I'm afraid of, uh, of leaving my children behind, but I've never really been afraid of, you know, of course I'm afraid of dying. You come up with a gun. I'm probably going to beg for my life, but I'm, you know, but for, for a different reason, I, I'm not worried about extinction. I don't think of myself as that. But do you, like, I'm neurotic. Do you, I, I constantly think I'm going to get sick and I'm going to die. And, <laughs> and, but death is a very big uh, theme in my, in my life, in my existence, of what I do. It's not a theme in yours? Not no. a hypochondriac? No. Why is it a theme in yours? I, like, don't, I don't know. I go to therapy and I am medicated. I don't know. But that's a big fear. It's a fear. And I have that fear of not only me, of the people I love, of yeah. the people, just it ending. Just it's always going to end. I'm always on the precipice of, of that worry. So that's, uh, I, I live in fear. Fear is my fuel. Are you an atheist? Uh, no. You're not? No. Are you? No. 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 Are but you religious? I'm no, but I'm 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 looking for God. I'm not sure which one to believe in. No, well, my thing. my belief personally is not not that I we need to, to to share it now. But we both agree 
that there's, there is a power, regardless of what you're calling it or what image you're putting in it, there is a power greater than us. Yes. And you have to respect that power. And anybody like you or me who's had children, it's go, this is a miracle. This is more than just science. Yep. This is more than just a, a chemical reaction. Mm -hmm. There is something there is something. Yes. And every group of people in culture has a different name for whatever this something is. Mm -hmm. So, but, but that yeah, per being perception is more than just sensation. You know, th there's something to human intelligence and imagination and things that, that there's something, there's almost like that a priori knowledge, that, that idea that we have knowledge that's not necessarily grounded in experience, but it's there. It, it, it well, again, back to, yeah. You, you know, your fear, uh, well, not your fear, you're, you, you're kind of uh, reaching for this enlightenment. You know, I think that that comes out of a fear, right? You, yes. you, you want to know, I want to know, I want to yes. understand because yes. I'm afraid. Yes, I'm always afraid. So I shouldn't say I'm not afraid. And I think, I think there are two things that are, are really, really, we're constantly told not to be afraid, uh, you know, or, or we, we value courage, which seems to be defined as the absence of fear. I think that's ridiculous. And then we're also told we have to love ourselves. I think that's fucking ridiculous. Why? Because I think we're, ex you know, I believe in the, uh, the existentialists. We're like, look, you're flawed from the start, man. I mean, well, like, but, but that, those are two different uh, subjects. Being loving yourself, you love your children. Do you love your children? I love my children to no end. Yes, they're flawed. Very much so. But so what a I mean flaw that, doesn't take away the. Okay, go ahead. No, what I mean is that. So so, um, loving myself is. I would say this. Um, I love what I could become. That so I love love I love the potential in human beings, but that requires a practice work um uh, adjustment but then aren't you always going to be dissatisfied with who you are currently if you're always reaching for something i, I hope greater? so i hope so because <laughs> i'm not sure what i would do without without that 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 sort of Martha Graham called that queer sense of dissatisfaction that an artist has. She, she but has not this, even an artist. But yeah, I, I human think being. I think I, I, that this life is a journey, you know, mm -hmm. and you should be something different tomorrow than you are today. And we all know people who kind of stagnate, and they're exactly the same. And you kind of, as they stay the same, and as you go on in your journey of life and knowledge, and how you, you're more hyper aware of you know, the flaws in somebody that doesn't move forward. That's right. That's a good point. You know, is that, is that what you, what, what do you, what do you get from therapy? Is that one of the things you get from therapy? The one thing that I try to get from therapy is just, um, there's nothing to fix, but I need to cope. So I, I'm, I'm learning coping skills, how mm -hmm. to just get through each and every waking moment of life. And which is, uh, you know, at times uh, painfully hard for, I, I think, for a lot of people, you know. And then, well, well, do you ever like sit back this for you and say, I'm Howie Mandel, <laughs> like you've done pretty, pretty well. I mean, is, is it? Yeah, but that's, be, be that, that's coming from a guy who doesn't really know me. <laughs> and most people don't <laughs> yeah. know me, yes. you know, and I, I can't tell you how many times uh, a moment I would love to be anybody else but Howie Mandel. <laughs> but, but. Thank God, or we wouldn't have Howie Mandel. I mean, I say this all the time. I literally start my my new act sometimes, and I go, you ever get tired of being yourself? I spend an inordinate amount of time wishing I was somebody else. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's probably where my imagination comes from. Right? I think that's where everybody's world comes from. I mean, if you look at uh, pop culture, that's why, you know, people put on makeup. That's mm -hmm. why you get a haircut. That's why you're dressed the way you're dressed. You know, every day we get up and we put on a costume and we clean ourselves up and make us uh, make ourselves smell in a way that we don't naturally smell because yeah. we want to create an aura, if not for ourselves first, for what we believe other people are going to view and 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 kind of accept us as so nobody is really happy in their own self. I don't think. Well, some people are. Pardon me. Some people are. Yeah, some I, people are that, just content with being them, and they don't care. And but I thought that's just what everyone idiots. is looking. <laughs> don't you think they're idiots? Or they no, or, or they lack they're... imagination. I would say maybe they lack imagination. Why? Maybe that's what we're striving for, though, just to be content and happy with who you are in the moment. Maybe people don't always have to strive for something. 
There's a difference between somebody who settles and a pioneer, and there's a difference between, you're right, somebody who says, uh, this is this is enough mm -hmm. and I am enough. And then there are people that say, I'm always incomplete. Um, but I would say this about that. I think that there's room for both, to your point. But I think for me and for Howie, at least, I'm gonna speak for you, but I may be wrong, but I think ahead, I'm right talk about for me. this. I will. I'm tired. Is I think that <laughs> we're both in the business of, of original self-expression, or at least that's the goal, right? And when you're an artist, you wanna do something original. And you want to do something that surprises you. And you want to do something that is um, something that people, you know, the, the public embrace. When people are in awe or astonished at what you do, I think what's satisfying about that is the fact that you somehow found that hidden gift. You, you showed up long enough and it was an act of faith. You know, it's like writing a book. When you write a novel. I always think about people, novelists are my heroes in many ways, because a great novelist sits down and somehow they have the ability to realize that I'm going to write this book. It's going to take me three years. It might, it might, Juno Diaz took 10 years to write the brief and wondrous life of Oscar Wilde. It's a masterpiece. 10 years. Now think about that for a second. He, was, he, he would show up every single day and he had the, the sort of um, faith to... to believe that if I keep showing up, I'm going to do something that is original, that is going to awe people, that will kind of like have us all go, wow, yeah, life is just like that. But and do you think relief. that was his intent? I do. I do. And I, I or, or, or this is the other thing I love about creating, or he knew the story existed already somewhere out there in the ether. And he had to keep showing up every day for it to show itself through him that idea that stephen pressfield talks about mathematicians talk about this i love this idea this is kind of things that make me believe in god it was like this guy he was he was a mathematician from russia he won the fields medal it comes with a million dollar prize and he disappeared he wouldn't accept it and he was and they found him in siberia a year later in his in his like ants rudimentary shack working on another theorem and he said you guys are giving the award to the radio and not the music. I just happened to have a wiring that was able to channel it, but the fear of them always, exi it already existed up there. Right. And you're like, dude, that's such a deep way of thinking. Some, uh, uh, Flannery O'Connor used to say that. She'd go, I'd sit at my typewriter every morning not to write, but in case something happens. What an act of faith. But, but you know, by the same token, and I'm not comparing myself in any way to, to any buddy that you just mentioned but i always say that everything i was ever expelled for gotten in trouble for was hated for is what i seem to get paid for uh, the truth of the matter is when people ask me about making it like how do you make it what would you do in in comedy what should i do and i and my answer is really i don't know <laughs> the, the 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 truth of the matter is that um i feel like i made it a, uh, and this is emblazoned in my mind april 19th 1977 I was at Yuck Yucks in Toronto as a, a, a as a as a patron, you know. As a patron, yes. And Mark Breslin, who was the host, yeah. said that anybody who wants to try this, you know, at midnight, you can go up and do a three minute set. And the, and the people um, that were there with me said you should go up. And I went okay. And and part of it is my ADHD, and I don't. I just react. And I go, okay, and I don't think about ramifications, which has gotten me into a lot of trouble, which is, you know, as much as it's helped me, it's actually hurt me also equally, but that's just life. But but the truth is that when I found that moment, when I found that I could just free myself and uh, kind of express myself, I didn't even have the thought or the or the drive to say, hey, this is a career. I can be a comedian. I could be on TV. I can get a paycheck. I just it was the first time I was on stage just being me, mm. just me, mm. uh, which was for all intents and purposes, uh, got eye rolls in school. Uh, people just thought I was silly. They just thought I was ridiculous. I didn't have a lot of friends. And in in a in a unified moment a lot of people laughed and related to why i thought this moment was crazy i made it and i think that that the fact that a larger number of people now know my name and i do get a paycheck and i've been able to pay my rent doing it 
is all the gravy that you talk about that mathematician receiving the award. The truth of the matter is if today I was a custodian and twice a week I could go over to the store and do this, that's the thing I look forward to is just, and regardless of what I do, is my stand-up comedy. So what I'm saying to you is that um, I think a lot more people are closed-minded in the sense they're very concerned and this is why I don't agree with you about the author, what he was, they're very concerned of what, how people are gonna react to whatever their work is or whatever they're doing. And they, as opposed to just being authentic and being and, and allowing your humanity to just open the door to whatever the universe can mm. allow you to see and react to. And that's what creates whoever you are. Oh, this is a commercial now. Mm -hmm. And you know who it's for? Raycons. Raycons. I love these. This is, uh, I just uh, bought some new ones. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you I, know, go ahead. I was going to say this perfect for this time of year, especially. You know how like everyone, it's a new year. So everyone's making changes and they want, they have New Year's resolutions. Mm -hmm. Mine was to be healthier and work out more. And that when I work out, I always use my Raycons because they're really, really comfortable and they're sweat resistant and I love them. And so. they're less expensive than the average, than than most of the other products. Right, so it's you could buy multiple. Good quality, uh -huh. they fit your ear, they're comfortable. Mm -hmm. There's so many options that you can get with the Raycons and I love it. And listening is our job. Yeah, right? yeah, you could use them to and, listen to this podcast. And it's your job too. You gotta listen. And if you're gonna listen to this podcast, I want you to listen every day with your Raycons. You know what else is cool about them? What? They have tap functions, so you could just tap them. And I have multiple of them. So I have some at home. I have some in my car so that if I forget them, I can take them with me to go work out. Water and sweat resistant, crystal clear. Uh, Quality. Call, yeah, for if I wanna make phone calls. Mm -hmm. It's all good. So how do they get them? Ready to buy something small with big impact? You go to buyraycon.com slash Howie Does Stuff today to get 15% off your Raycon order. That's buyraycon.com slash Howie Does Stuff to score 15% off. Buyraycon.com slash Howie Does Stuff. Okay. Back to the pot. Yeah, I don't think you ever lose the insecurity. You know, as you were talking, I was thinking about what I remember you. It's really interesting because you said to be yourself. I was never able to do that. And when I think about you and I think about St. Elsewhere and I think about your your roots and when you how you kind of captured people's attention, I swear to God, um, I think about your eyes because I believed everything you did. And I believed you when you were on stage, and I believed you when you were make, doing an interview about is like daddy. Daddy uh, puts a glove on his head and lets it just kind of shoot up. I remember right, these right. things very well about you. This right. is really weird, but I remember everything about you, um, and I remember your eyes. And because you always looked a little wounded and terrified, I am terrified. But I believed you. I always believed you. I believed you as an actor. I think that's what everybody did. So you know yeah, you were insecure. Yeah, maybe you didn't think you were enough and all that, but that's who you are. That is who you are. That is your set point. I don't think you, I hope you never lose that. Right, so, but so, we, we all don't. You know, that is our coping, our, our insecurity is the fuel of life. And our ins it's, it, what is your coping skill? Some people, whether, you know, it's, it's going to get, uh, you know, surgeries and, and kind of yeah. enhance whatever yeah. their look is so that they can feel better. That's a bad coping mechanism. It I think it is. Yeah, it's the monkey's but, paw. But yeah. some people will show up on stage in front of strangers and try to uh, show them your wear. That's, so that's that a good one. Well, it's good for us. No, nope. that's a, there's a, there, no, nope. there's criteria. See, the, the, I disagree. I do? think, yeah. Okay. I think that altering your image to make yourself feel better about yourself isn't necessarily a bad thing. Why? N nothing is necessary. I haven't done it. I don't feel the need to do it. But I think if someone else feels the need to do it and it makes them happier, then it's not a negative thing. I agree with you. I, I wasn't talking about that. I was saying oh. if that's the end all and be all. So if yeah. you continue to do that thinking that's going to lead somewhere, Got it. I think you're in trouble. But I, but I think that there are healthy ways to cope, which help you grow. There are ways that allow you to you sort of cope. Um, and so, so here, here would be the difference. One might be avoidance. One might be noise. One might be to deafen 
the truth that's ringing in your ears. The other may be to face and take responsibility for whatever is going on. And I think that's where the gold lies. And I think that is your job. So, so you're, you're faced with a challenge. Let's call it self-loathing. You don't like the way you look or whatever it might be. When you get a little surgery, you know, whether you get a nose job or whatever it is, this is a little bit, that, that's not, neither here nor there, a hair transplant. I don't care about all that. What I'm saying is that just don't let that be the end all and be all. The, the, the responsibility is I have this shortcoming. I have this hole. I have this whatever it might be. I'm afraid. Well, I think the gold lies in confronting it in whatever, and that's sort of the hero's journey, right? The idea that uh, I'll, go, I'll go under the castle, fight the dragon, you know, I'll face chaos. And I think that my, my man tears, the, the special, the idea was that you will not know, you can get ready for chaos. You can get ready for the enemy. You can get ready for your home invasion or whatever. You can, you can buy guns, take jujitsu, box. You can, be, you can take your vitamins, wear your seatbelt, just be ready for all that stuff. Your chaos will come in a form you don't recognize, bearing weaponry you have no armor for. That is the point of existence for us. And who are you then? It was like Teddy Atlas had that great saying, because you're not a doctor until you, uh, there's a kid bleeding from every orifice and you have no idea how to save him. There's nothing in the textbook, but you find a way. And you're not a boxer until that guy across the ring knows every pattern you have and hits harder and has got you figured out and somehow you figure out a way. That was why Ali was so great. Ali could improvise in the moment. Ali was like, this guy took everything away from me and I planned this and now I'm gonna improvise and do something he never expected and not even, not even my trainer expected. That's the difference between a great jazz musician who swings, who decides I can play my horn and play these notes and now I'm gonna go swing, I'm gonna go improvise and I'm gonna go within the theme, I'm gonna go all the way out here and I'm gonna find my way back and if I don't find my way back, that audience is gonna know and I'm gonna crash and burn. You know, so for me, that would be the difference between facing something head on and getting something from it. And then, you know, the other thing, which is we all do this noise, drugs, booze, surgery, all the things we see in LA and all the things we all have some of that in us, but again, are, are you facing all this in your life? Are I you think practicing? I have, I have, but yeah, yeah. Um, I th we all do. What's um, the hardest thing you've gone through? I think, um, I mean, I think a large part of it is just, I mean, I, I, it's kind of a personal thing, you know, but, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you off air maybe, I Okay. but it's, it's a, it's a tough one. Okay. It's a tough one, and but without feel, going into it, but I'm, I'm over it. I'm, okay. But what, what, what you have to get over is sometimes in life, um, see, see, here's the other fascinating thing about it. Something can happen to you. Right. Somebody can can ruin can try to ruin your life right. for no reason or whatever right. reason they have and you um you can get through it right you can you can preserve your life and stuff like that but you have to figure out a way to forgive that person or those people you have to figure out a way you, you know you could lose your entire business somebody could sue you or somebody could do something to you this happens all the time somebody could come in and break rob you or whatever and some people it really ruins them you could be sent to war and everything you thought was true is not. It's made a mockery of. That you, you, when you come through the chaos, you have to figure out a way to forgive the perpetrators and mean Do it. You? Because if you don't, if you don't, if you don't, you're gonna be stuck over here. You're gonna be fighting them and you'll never stop fighting them. And there's too much work to do over here. You're not going to be able to create on the level you do because you're going to have resentment and blame. And I think those that is the challenge. The great challenge is that's where you become a warrior. What about <clears throat> what about just negating that image instead of like of whatever it was or whatever they did and distracting yourself and moving forward without giving the there's a lot of power in forgiveness. He's a big fan of distraction. Like yes, that's not, my whole life. Yeah, <laughs> distraction instead of facing so, stuff head on. So I'm not facing. I'm not. I'm not um, focusing on doing anything about how I was wronged in the past or how I could fix whatever happened. You're not. No, I. I just want to. I want to live in the now. And then in the now. So do you feel betrayed by certain people? Yeah. 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 We all do. Yeah. 
But that's humanity. You're yeah. going to, the longer you live, the more people it's, you come in contact with, it's just going to happen. You had your heart broken in a way. Everybody does. Yes. I don't think there's anybody, I, mean. I don't think there's anybody that has not gone through. And, and, and whether when you hear what somebody else's hurdle is, you go, oh, that's nothing compared to me. Well, it is. It depends on how, and you know this now as a parent. Yeah. You know, when you watch, I always thought that I was going to grow up and have kids and teach them about the world, but I've grown up and I've had children and they teach me about the world because you're watching how a human, you know, kind of is created and how a psyche is created. And what I, what I was saying is it's all coping. It's all coping. How do they cope? Like something happens to one kid and, and nothing terrible, but they go over, like they're just destroyed because yeah, of it. Yeah. And then another kid is like a fucking brick wall and nothing destroys. It's how we deal with what happens. Yes. But not, I don't give any power to what happened in the past as opposed to, I want to, as you just said, I want to distract myself and live in the now. Mm. Because well, even- Well, part of that's really necessary, right? Right. But, um. I, I think that to your point, everybody gets their heart broken, the contract of life broken. There are people that are, it's, you're going to be shocked by people. You, you're going to have an idea of how human beings are. I had a, my friend's a billionaire and, uh, and he said to me, he goes, do you know what the problem with you dude is? Cause I, I, I would collect people and, and you know, I just get burned and just, you know, I just, I, from relationships I had to, to just people, you know, with women or whoever it was. You know, it's like you, sometimes you're walking through the neighborhood, you get hit in the head with a brick, but you were walking through a neighborhood where they were throwing a lot of bricks. So part of it's accepting how you lived your life that that brought you to that point, because maybe you're a little broken and crazy. So you right, but if somebody crazy. throw a brick and it hits you in the head, there's no way you can forgive that person for throwing a brick. They shouldn't have been throwing bricks. Um, yes, or that is that might be part of the whole picture. Like, like so, so. What's the alternative? The alternative would be that um, my head that, doesn't hurt anymore. Move on. That's right. But moving on has to, you have to let, you have to in your own way. If you can completely block them out of your head, which you can do sometimes, yes. But for me, I have to figure out a way to forgive and, 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 and mean it and give love. Like that for me, like I got to figure that out. That's very church like. It, well, it's probably very Christian. That's what I'm and saying. And I'm not a Christian, but it's, power forgiveness that idea of turning the other cheek that what made that what made jesus christ who was a rabbi a radical a thinker was the idea that you should love your enemy <laughs> turn the other cheek that's outrageous especially like when he came the the soil that christianity was you know founded and was was in the roman ethos the idea of might makes right the strongest the biggest sword and stuff like that well no my weakness is my my strength is going to be my weakness i'm going to love my enemy i'm going to turn the other cheek and i'm going to forgive you no matter what you do you can put me up on a cross and torture me for three days and oh by the way forgive them father they know not what they do and die like that's at the at the prime of his life at 33 years old or whatever you know i'm again i'm not a christian but i i the power of that that example is probably why the bible's been around for 2500 years and is still relevant to a lot of people's lives you know to an extent all of us you know much lesser extent go aspire through something to have like, that kind of power yes but i don't know anybody that does okay so wait Whoa. let me ask you if this also applies to your kids let's say yeah. if there's some another child that is bullying and torturing yeah. your kid do mm -hmm. you tell them that you need to find a way to forgive them well i also believe in strength uh -huh. And I also believe in. You being told me today on the way in that you've been teaching your son how to box. Yes. So no. So the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. And I teach him how to box, and 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 like as in there's one there's to hitting mitts, and then there's when you throw a punch, something's coming back, and uh, so there's boxing, and then there's real boxing. Mm -hmm. It was like when I learned how to box with uh, Wayne McCulloch and and uh, Tony Jeffries, both Wayne McCulloch's a world champion. Right. And I'm watching this guy hit mitts. He was kind of a famous guy. And he's hitting mitts. He's doing really well. And I had done enough kickboxing and all that. And I said, I said, hey, does that work in real fighting? And he goes, not really. And I go, okay, look at me. I'm an actor. I'm never going to be a tough guy. But I want to learn how to knock somebody out. I'm, I'm interested in how I take this hand and put it on your jaw. That's what I want. So whatever we got to do to that, which means you got to get in the ring, you got to spar. I stopped doing it. I got started getting too dizzy, and I'm just an idiot. But, but 
Did you I get was, hurt? I was you got hurt? Yeah, but I was more interested in that. I wanted to learn how to do, I wanted the, I wanted the utility of that. Fight. Because it's a, yeah, it's a different thing. Not it, the sport. You wanted to. Well, the sport, the sport of boxing is fighting. You can't play, you can't play boxing. Now, if I was getting in the ring with a really good guy, they would know I'm an actor, I'm an old man, let's relax. You know, you got to let them know that. Don't get, when an actor tells you, like a guy like me says, I spar. Right. Okay. Ask him, what do you, what do you mean, by, with who? I spar with guys like me. I spar with regular guys. But don't tell me you spar with pros or good amateurs. Don't say that because it's insulting and you'll get knocked out if you do that. Because that's not what you do. There are guys that do that for a living. You're an actor. You, you jump around a ring so you can tell people you box. But then that's me. So let's 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 be very very real about it. But I, I teach my son how to be familiar with the language of combat because, in my opinion, life is also a fight. It's also a war, and there are people that will take whatever they can from you. So I'm not saying to be weak. I'm saying, you know, it's like that, That um, again, I'm, I'll quote Jordan Peterson who said, you should be a monster. You should have the ability to commit extreme violence, and then you voluntarily will be able to keep it, you know, in check. But I believe in that. I believe in, in I believe in being familiar with so violence. So you wouldn't be you wouldn't be teaching your child to walk away if somebody was, as she said, bullying. I want, I want my kid to be able to walk away 100%, but from a position of strength. There's a big difference between having to walk away and being able to look at the guy and go, I could break, I could pull your head off your spine right now or knock you out, but I'm going to walk away or even better. You might be tough, but I'll keep you busy. I'll keep you busy. You might fight me, but you'll remember me, <laughs> you know, that's you teach the same thing to your daughter. Yeah, I do, but she won't, she, my daughter needs no help from me. My daughter is fierce and she won't let me teach her some of the things, you know, but she's, she's fierce and she's, my daughter's such an intellectual that she'll do it on her own time, you know, but How she's really she? into tennis, 14. Yeah. She's a black belt. Are you? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. In what? Taekwondo. Yeah, me too. That's great. So would you guys uh, prepare no, to I'm fight? No, I'm not sparring We will spar at dawn. <laughs> we'll spar at dawn. We will meet on the hill. Yes. yes. But, I, you know, I, the, the, it's, you're one of the most fascinating people. I didn't know you this. Uh, I probably still don't know you that well. But you're, you're incredibly fascinating and well-read. And uh, this is probably why. You got into podcasting probably before most people I know. What year did you start podcasting? Oh, man, I mean, I literally... I mean, it was so, so Rogan started doing his podcast and we would do it in his like garage or so he had this spare room in his house. Right. You know, I mean, and, uh, and then he just kept bugging me to do a podcast. So I started mine and it was, but I just wasn't, I just wasn't consistent enough. And, and then I did the 10 minute what podcast. Year, what year, what year was that? Uh, that was God. I, I mean, that was literally probably, I remember when Joe called me and said, I'm not going to act anymore. Remember, he was in an audition, and he goes, I don't want to do this anymore, <laughs> to the director. Director, can you try it a different way? He goes, nah, I don't want to do that. If you cast me, I'll do it on set, but I'm not doing that here, and walked out. And he never, he never went back. He never acted again. And he called me, and he goes, I don't want to do this shit anymore. Wow. And I was I like, dude, thing. I said that. I go, dude, wow. I mean, okay, I'll be trying to do, make it, and I'll see you later. And he just said, I'm going to do my own thing. And he started with Joe Rogan TV. Then he started doing this podcast. I don't know what the fuck a podcast was. And, and I think I probably did my first podcast really 13 years ago. I mean, it was before well, anybody. I was that, making money. I remember I was making all this money and my agents didn't know. They didn't wait, even 13 know. years ago you were making money no, at no, podcasting? No, 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 But like eight years ago, I started making money. Right. Like money. And, and, and then like, you know, I, to the point where I was like, I didn't really need to do TV. I was like, I could go do this sitcom that'll go away in about four months or it'll never go. And, but I got this, I'm building, I, I started getting recognized by the TSA guys. Like when I go through, you know, when I was touring and stuff, I was like, something's going on here. They were calling me the kid. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And then- Oh, I, you didn't come up with that name for yourself? I did. Yeah. The, yeah. Fighter, the fighter and the kid. The right. kid, the kid was like, I was doing a movie with Jane Lynch and, right. I, and I, and I got to the set and I was like, guys, I have a nickname. And they were like, you do? I go, yeah, call me the kid. I'm young. I stay young. And, and they were like, okay, kid. I go, no, no, it's the kid, please. And it was so stupid. <laughs> so the camera guy would be like, uh, the kid, can you get your, I'm the not kid. a friend. <laughs> and it was just so dumb. And I, I gave myself the nickname. You know, it's just 
really ridiculous. It was now, not so ridiculous. He yeah, was yeah. laughing now. I know, right? Yeah. So you started making money. You didn't know. Yeah. I mean, you know, I didn't know. And my, my agents, I remember they were like, we got this thing. And I'm like, I remember saying to my agent, I go, uh, let, let me tell you what I make a week and, 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 you know, or a month or something. And he was like, what? Podcast? How? He had, they had no idea about sponsors or anything. And, well, and how did you know? Did you have somebody? Like, how, were Brendan you Schaub, you know, Brendan Schaub and I, he was a UFC fighter. And we right, just but, started talking like dudes and it just, you know. Right, but then did you mm -hmm. go out, were you with a company? Did you go out and, and uh, how did you get sponsors? We bought, we bet on ourselves. We, we just found an agent and said, hey, listen, you want a percentage and we want to own this whole thing. So we owned the whole podcast. So then companies just started coming. Yeah, to you as you get numbers, you. as you get, you know, they were they, some of the pioneer companies were like, let's try this. And now, you know, podcasts are how you market your products. Now it's a huge business. It's just everybody's got a podcast. So do you, and you're a really good actor. Thank and you. you've had a lot of success in acting, mm -hmm. but you're not going the Joe Rogan route where you. No, you, there's a, I might do a movie. I just, I'm waiting to hear about this really cool movie, horror movie. And and so, but you want to still pursue acting. You like acting. I do. And but you don't need to act, and you do it because you like it. Yeah, I hate acting too, though. I what? hate it. You hate it. <laughs> yeah, I fucking hate it. You just like, do you like it? I know. I fucking love it, and I fucking hate Why? it. Why? Because you got to touch the hell of acting <laughs> to hit the heaven of acting. Yeah. Now you understand, my son. Yeah. <laughs> now you understand. Why you do say you you're it? old, but you're young. <laughs> Sit at my feet. Um, I, you know, I hate the process. I fucking hate the waking up early on the set and doing all the shit. I just, you know, it's like skiing. I hate the cold and I hate the gear and the boots hurt my feet. If I could somehow be on the top of the mountain and be really good at skiing, I'd be into skiing. Fuck skiing. And, and acting is the same way. I have a problem with it. You do. I didn't like it. I, I, I left it in it kind of in the eighties and nineties when you I did, was, right? yeah. when I was doing something else. Yeah, because I didn't like I didn't like movie making. Oh well, a TV was okay. Yeah, but, but it's movie so much making time. so much time where you you read uh, you know, a paragraph or two and they go cut and then you go back to your trailer and you're sitting there for three hours so they can set it up on another angle. I know. And then you're also at the mercy as somebody like you who comes from uh, I think that you, like me, uh, have uh, maybe an issue with uh, our own personal control. We want to control. That's why we do what we do and why yes. and how we do what we do. And that's why I'm also fascinated when I see the Academy Awards and it's given so much uh, hype that these people are so amazing and we listen to that. They're just people who pretend. Yeah. You know, it's just pretending. Yeah. And at the mercy of somebody else who edits you, cuts you, directs you, writes your words, we have very little to do with how it looks on the screen, even if we're good at it. Yes, that's exactly right. So I, I was really uncomfortable with number one, the time that it took and handing myself over creatively to anybody else. And then if it's a, if it's a success, it's an accident because there are so many moving parts and so many things can go wrong. Everything. How many times have you done projects where it's like, here it goes and then something happens in the news and it just loses its relevance? I don't know. Like I did this amazing pilot where I was holding a gun and I had an indoor gun range in my house. That was part of the character. It was hilarious character. And then Columbine happened right before they were going to okay the pilot. Then Rupert Murdoch, up. this is what I hear, said, no way, no way, because I was loading a Desert Eagle. And, you know, I mean, I get timing. it. Timing. Right, timing. There's a thousand things. And and then, like, to your point, like, I always, like, I admire De Niro and, and Meryl Streep, but, like, the shit they have to do, the meticulous, weird, like, piecemeal behavior that you have to master and the consistency you have to keep in your head it's like, dude, your that string on your sweatshirt was over here. You got to pull it out. We got to do it again. Plus, the lighting wasn't hitting your face. Can you bring your when you say that line? Like, come on, man. Daniel Day Lewis. Like, they were asking him what his. It was so funny. Like, he, he's the best, I think. You know. Right. And you know, and the guy's wearing like the same outfit when he's doing Gangs in New York, and he perfected an accent from back then, and and you know, and he actually became a fucking butcher. Like, dude, all right, you know, okay. And they were like, well, what is your process? He goes, it doesn't matter. I'm basically a boring middle-class Englishman. So this is how I keep myself from going crazy. It's, it's amazing. I'm like, yes. You hang with a lot of these people. I right? mean, no. 
not Daniel Day Lewis, but oh, uh, we yeah, were just yeah. talking before you got on. Maybe you don't want to. Yeah. Uh, but you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I you hang. were saying you were saying that um, uh, you you hang with these people, and uh, because you seem to be in a really good place in life. I am. And um, you, you, we had a conversation right before we went on the air that you had talked to David Blaine. David mm -hmm. Blaine was at a party you were attending yeah. or whatever, and he gave you shit for well, you I, not feeling worthy of yeah. being with the people that you were with. And I don't know where that, after this, you've, you've been incredibly motivational. You, uh, I feel like I've just been to a really good therapy session, by the way, because <laughs> you're pretty smart and you give us, you inspire and in, in, in TED your talk. Opinion. We were in a, a TED, TED talk. TED talk, yeah. And you're incredibly intuitive. And then that 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 kind of didn't weigh evenly with the conversation we had right before we went on the air. Yeah, well, um, because I, I, I was telling, I did this Patrick Beth Davis podcast. Too. I don't know if you know him, but I, I love the guy. And he's got this great podcast. He's just one of those guys who made like $200 million or something. But he said, I'm going to do a podcast because I want to talk to interesting people. And that's how his brain is. And I was telling a story about how um, I got to know Stallone's uh, daughters would come to my stand-up and they're just great gals. They grew up like in L.A., but somehow those, those that family and those girls have figured out a way to basically be as grounded as any girl you'd find in Jersey. They're just feet on the ground, great family, good people. And, and they, they would invite me and they said, you'd love my dad. You know, it's, you got to come to fight night or you got to come to Super Bowl. So I start getting invited to Stallone's house when the Super Bowl or when there was a big fight. Well, when you go to Stallone's house, what happens is his friends come by guys like, I don't know, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, Michael Strahan, uh, you know, um, Al Pacino, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, David Blaine, um, you know, Guy Fieri comes by to cook some food. That This is the kind of stuff that's going on in the house. Bill Burr is over here. And, and I'm like, and I'm sitting there at this house. And at one point I was standing in a, in a group with uh, Al Pacino. Uh, I think it was Sugar Ray Leonard, Schwarzenegger, and and, and a guy named Sylvester Stallone. And we're all talking. And that's kind of cool. That kind of part of my cool. history. And Bill Burr walked by and he goes with a cigar. He goes, hey, you've been here an hour already. Get over it. You know, <laughs> typical Bill fashion, hilarious. And David called me and said, hey, listen, when you tell that story, don't be so reverential. Like, you belong there. Don't, don't, don't act like they have something over you. You're a talented guy and you have something that they can't do. You do stand up. And like, you know, David checked me. He kind of like reminded me that you come to a point in life where it's like, all right, all right. You know, it's great to be here. I love what you do. I like you. I admire you. But, you know, I'm not going to be reverential. I'm not going to be too reverential because you do your thing. I do my thing. And and did that did those words sink in? Do you feel very that? Very much so. Very much so. But I just appreciated him reminding me. Sometimes it's good to have a friend who reminds you of those things. You also you, know? you also have to realize that what um they have and you have is incredibly fleeting. You know, we get we get this. Uh, God, I, yes. I, I just did an interview, and and I mean, you've been asked this ad nauseum, but people will always say, "How do you want to be remembered?" And I always say, I won't. I won't. <laughs> Amen. I promise you, I won't. It doesn't matter. I just, unless it's something I did nice yesterday, I want people to be happy with what I did yesterday. Yeah. But, you know, how many times, and, and I know this from having children and their children's children, the biggest stars and the whatever was considered the most important thing at the moment, they don't know. Ask a 25 year old who Paul Newman was. Right. Like, like, right. What? Well, they love the dressing. <laughs> they, the guy, from the dressing. Yeah, the dressing, the guy yeah. from the dressing. But I know when she was younger, I took her. We went to uh, was it the Billboard Music Awards and P Diddy. When P Diddy launched, um, he uh, what was the song? Uh, um, uh, he did the Sting, the Sting song. song. Yeah, you know he he launched his career with the, the first one. I'll remember I'll, you to, I'll be, to I'll be missing you. I yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. Oh, I love that song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll be missing. Yeah, you but P Diddy did yeah, it, yeah, right? Yeah, I know. And then on the MTV Music Awards, wherever we were. It was a, like a surprise. Sting came out and played guitar on it. 
And she turned to me and she goes, ah, oh, the white guy's Who's ruining it. Who's this old guy that's ruining the song? <laughs> <laughs> And and in that moment, that the way that's a great <laughs> metaphor for the, our, everybody's life. That but that's what you know. We all think you know. I yeah. want to be the big you know. In in the moment when you're on the set, when you're the kid, when you're you know the world, and and even as a child, in whatever moment, whatever you're living, the world revolves around you. You realize in this universe, we are such a small speck yeah and even though those specks that you happen to be encircled with have names that other people probably yeah. recognize right That's now right. those names will mean nothing in 40 years they're already exactly i mean correct right. this is the nature of what they call fame which doesn't really exist it's right weird and fame thing. is just well fame is just the amount you know the amount of people that kind of know you in yeah. the moment but yeah. that you know as somebody who's been doing this for 45 years you know I almost left in 2005 because I couldn't sell a half a club. And I was sitting in the uh, audition rooms reading for five lines and under, you, you know, go. in 2005. And then I got deal or no deal and that kind of changed it. And I'll probably be back there again on the folding Always, chairs, you know? you know? So I kind of understand that, but you are, uh, you deserve all the success you have. You, you deserve even more success than you have. And I think you are, I think, and maybe this is, I think you're really hitting your stride in in um, your knowledge and your ability to communicate your knowledge. I mm. think you're more than just a comic and more than just an actor. And people, I appreciate that. I mean, I you know, for me, I think we all come to a point where you you start to realize that you can stand on your own two feet, and you are enough. And and so so you know, like Stephen Jobs said something really interesting once. He said, "When I realized that the world was made by people." Everything around me was made by people no smarter than I was. Everything changed for me. No, it's just my mother-in-law. Oh, <laughs> the phone <laughs> was yeah. Yeah, everything was it, everything changed for you. Yeah, so you know, I think part of maturity and part of like hitting your stride is is realizing that um, you can do this. Just stay truthful. Line yourself up with the truth. Line yourself up with the best version of what you th that you can conceive of as yourself. It takes courage, but really look at that. Who, what is the, who is the hero, who is the heroic version of Howie Mandel or Brian Callen or whatever? Who, who is that? Really? That's a real question. Like, like who, if you were going to a movie about your life and you were the star of your own fucking movie, who do you, how do you truly want to behave? And who are you going to be when chaos hits? Who are you going to be when you might die? Like, really? That's, that's, that's what you have to ask yourself. And I don't care if you're afraid or whatever, but when the dragon comes, you know, who are you going to be? And I think that's a really important question to ask yourself every single morning and maybe every hour. I don't know. It doesn't sound like fun. It, it is fun. It doesn't have to be fun, but it sure as hell has meaning to it. It really and, does. And it makes and you feel important. proud. And I think the people who are listening to this and watching this are learning and probably better for this particular episode. I can't tell you what this means to me that you would show up and, and, and do that. Are you happy? I'm a fan. Are you happy? I'm very happy. Yeah. I mean, happy. I'm Content? fulfilled. Yeah. You are? Yeah. yeah I like uh You have a new kid? Yeah. That's that's fantastic. A I one love, year old. Yeah, I, I have I, I don't think I'm ever happier than when I'm teaching my kids something. I love watching my son learn and build confidence. What does the one year old do now? Does he he's does, uh, does he say dada? He says dada and he says T, which means tree. And I <laughs> and he's very into my wife's clothes and her sequins. So Mm. You know, we never know, huh? We might, don't know. We, well, he might be pretty. a little Isaac Mizrahi. My son may be, maybe at one, he may be, he may have a taste for fashion and, uh, you know. And You men. should connect him with Heidi. Clue. Yeah. Maybe I'll do that. Yeah. She's painfully beautiful. I sat on a plane with her once. I sit on a desk with her. She you is do? stunning. Oh, that's right. Yeah. She's just. Beautiful. Like it was like God put her on the earth. To mm -hmm. make all of us feel bad, like this is what you could have been. <laughs> really? Like, you you know. look at Heidi that way. I wish I looked like that. Well, I'm. This is the time I want to mention that I'm now going through transition. Everybody. This is wow. the second time you've mentioned comparing yourself to someone. Do you? You know that, that that's going to be all that's going to be my clickbait. <laughs> it's yeah. all I do. <laughs> do you compare yourself to others? Often? All the time. That's that's all I do. Yeah. I don't think it's a healthy exercise, but again, it goes back to wishing you were anybody but yourself. Yeah. But that come. That's that's. But self awareness. That kind of deep self awareness and doubt is what what gives him and people like me that artistry to kind of 
communicate our foibles, our, our desires. And that's what comedy, basically, that's the basis of comedy. And that's why you're so good at what you do. And I, I, I still, it's indelible in, uh, it's just an, an impression. In my, I can't get the thought of you performing live out of my head. Cause that was, you talk about that night I crushed. You are pretty amazing, and you're pretty amazing. So the Man Tears is what's- Man Tears is on, uh, yeah, on YouTube? YouTube. That's my new special. It just dropped. Okay. And then uh, I'll be I'll be at the comic strip in Edmonton. Have you done that at the uh, Edmonton? I haven't been to the comic strip, but oh, I've been to Edmonton. You know, I'm Canadian. Oh, you are? Yeah, born and raised. I love performing Tur in Canada. I'm in Toronto. I'm and back I, since COVID, so it's I love Edmonton. January, yeah. you know, February 23rd, 24th, 25th. And we go back and we do tours across, you know, I'm, I'm involved with JFL. Oh, yeah, I'm one yeah, of the I'm one of the owners of JFL, but uh, but you're amazing. You really are, and I hope this is not the last time that you come and talk. And I'm a big fan of your podcast. You need to come do Fighter and the Kid. You need to invite me. You're invited. Then so, I'm doing it. So you let me know. I'll have my people reach out to you. Well, oh, my yeah. people are right here. You'll set it up. We'll go right. You have a whole team over there. Look at them. Too. Family, and they're all wearing the same outfit. God, well, that's so my strict. merch. That's, that's, it's, that's it's merch. So strict stuff, <laughs> stuff merch. Oh, then they'll wear it, and they'll uh, get a I tattoo. Like the only one's not wearing it are your kids. My kids and me are not wearing it. <laughs> How dare you? Do you want some merch? I will wear that in a heartbeat. Really? Yeah, so go that? to so just go to howiemandel.com. He's not giving you one. No, no, here you go. Here you go. I love it. <laughs> what size are you? I'm medium. Medium. Get him. Do you want a black hoodie? Yeah. What do I want you want? A black hoodie. I like that. Black a black hoodie. Like medium. That. Go get him. Stop. He doesn't. Need, you went to Howie Mandel. You didn't even have to go to HowieMandel.com. That's amazing. Uh, See, that's what I did. This is. Howie. Thank. What? Yeah. Just for fun, I'd love to get his uh, opinion on Preacher's comment he had on the podcast the other day. Can I show that to you real quick? Just yeah. for fun. Oh, I mean, what did Preacher you know, say? Preacher Lawson, don't you? I love Preacher Lawson. Yeah. yeah what did he say? Really quick. Okay. I'm curious what you think about this. If he was. But you last time you were on, you said you wanted to fight Joe Rogan. You still willing to say, fight I Joe would, Rogan? Yes, I would you fight said, Joe Rogan. Why yeah. would I not fight Joe Rogan? Even if he you knocks still me out, I'm going to fall on a pile of money. I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Are oh. you still training? Yeah, I still. Yeah, he's, he's training mixed martial arts. Yeah, well, so, so Preacher's an athletic guy. Mm. Yeah. I saw his fight. Yeah. He can throw hands. Preacher's, preachers uh, you know, but here's the thing. He's young. He's a lot younger than Joe. Oh. Joe's 55. Right. You know, Joe can kick your lights out, and he's a legit black belt in jujitsu. But Joe's not going to take that fight because, you know, time, father time. Preacher's too young. So you're, Preacher's too, too young. Yeah. What a nice way of saying he's Joe's good, too old. Yeah, he is. <laughs> and Preacher's, Preacher's in the middle of, like, trying to actually do an MMA thing. He's he really is. Athletic, handsome, funny. He's got it all. Keep him away from my women. All right. My On wife. that note... <laughs> That's the wrong <laughs> guy hit the wrong cue. <laughs> That's awesome. Make it easy.